funny. So uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, invite in the most connected guys I know uh, in the world. So uh, Hannes Sjöblad, are you here? So, so I'll, uh, right. you'll steal your seats <laughs> and we'll see you. I've warmed it up for you. <laughs> thank, you thank you, thank you. Hey, good to see you. So Hannes is actually the guy that makes me seem like I know a lot of technology because he gives me all these things. He's the chief disruption officer at Epicenter and he's also the ambassador for Singularity University. Uh, and here we have Chris. Hi, Chris. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Good, good, good. You are the most connected man in the world. What is that? <laughs> About 10 years ago, I started wearing sensors all over my body and putting them in my home. And during this process, I've learned a lot about modifying my physical health, my mental health, and my spiritual health. And, 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 <laughs> and how does that work? You're also a biohacker, Hannes. You have a lot of technology. You get your train tickets beamed to your hands from, from SJ and other things. So what is a biohacker? So. Um, Biohackers like Chris and myself, we work with modifying uh, the human body with technology. And um, the interesting thing is that this used to be something, li just like uh, IT, it used to be something that only experts could do in expensive settings. And now it's democratized and anybody can work with these technologies. But what are some of the things you do then, Chris? Oh, for me, it really started off just measuring simple things I did online, how much time I spent on certain websites or in certain applications. But then over time, it evolved into measuring things on my body, <laughs> measuring things in my environment, and putting all of those things into a repository. Just yesterday, um, the United States passed a, where, a law where these pills now, are, you can swallow them, and these little chips are, go through your system and measure things. So we now have pills people will be able to take that are smart pills. So. The world looks out like I used to uh, just a few years ago. But, but what are the things that they teach us, that this uh, biohacking teaches you about yourself? Or how do you, how do you sort of upgrade? Or what does it do that is good for you? I think Hannes might be a better person to ask about that. I have a different uh, space on my journey. I'm more looking at it from a spiritual aspect lately. The physical stuff I'll leave to maybe Hannes. Well, okay, well, so Chris, you do the physical and you do the spiritual, so physical. Exactly. Chris <laughs> is more of a mindful cyborg. He actually thinks and reflects <laughs> upon what technology does to him, whereas I'm more like a hunting dog. I'm just running really hard after the rabbits. So they're, they're looking different for the types next of cyborgs. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm getting it. Exactly. And, there are and what do you do with the, physi so the, the physical things that you play around Right, with. so there is a, a range of different technologies you can do to modify the human body. You can do pharmaceutical interventions, you can take smart drugs, or you can take hormones and supplements, etc. And then we have cybernetic interventions, which is wearables, implants, prosthetics, medtech implants. But ultimately, Ola, the most interesting thing that is happening is digital biology, and that we now can also modify genetics of living organisms. So, and I've I heard some that you, uh, not you, but others, other biohackers made a, a, a cat that glows in the dark because you just modified the, the DNA. What, what are some of the things you think will happen with that going forward? Well, it will start with. Uh, that we will uh, el begin to eliminate disease, inheritable diseases, uh, through genetic therapies. But there is also a vision over time that we will be able to use viruses as apps for the human body. And this is still a few years in the future, but we can conceptually see how this can be done. And you release, a little bit like a vaccine, you can release a virus that modifies your metabolism in some way uh, for various purposes. I'm going from, from, from body to mind here because I get a lot of philosophical questions. Could you take me through, you say spirituality uh, and, and sort of connectivity yeah. or measuring everything. What do you mean by that? How does, it, how does it become a spiritual experience? You know, for me, the act of being mindful is really the act of observing yourself at a level above your conscious thoughts. So you're not avoiding thoughts, you're just aware of them. As you start to put technology on your body and in your life, you become very aware of behavior. As we connect to other people on social media, as we connect to other people in fitness applications, we become aware of their behavior. Uh, so for me, the evolution over the past 10 years is the interconnected relationship of all of these people being aware of each other. So what I'm noticing is there's an evolved sense of time, an evolved sense of a hive mind, if you would, 
in people who are ultra connected. And they're developing new senses, senses of being able to perceive and perceal, I'm sorry, perceive and see time to feel it in each other. Um, also, I think it's really important to state that a lot of the problems that we are experiencing today around the world come from the overconnectedness that many of us are feeling. If you just take Facebook, for example, in Facebook, many of your memories are served back to you. Each day you get shown things you did a year ago. And for a lot of people, they started changing their profile photos and, and posting about disasters and tragedies. So constantly, as a species, we're being reserved information that is disheartening from our past. And I think we haven't really equipped people to talk about what this means to profoundly live in a perpetual state of disaster. What, what are you measuring on yourself right now on a day like this? What kind of <laughs> things are going on? Every day gets the same, what I call a uh, behavior stack. So everything I do that's connected to anything digitally, so any apps I launch, uh, any websites I go to, um, after that kind of immediate digital uh, stack, I then move into the body. So the body usually collects all the vitals. So blood pressure, blood sugar, um, uh, body temperature, respiration, heart rate, and then non-volatile uh, body measurements like sleep, uh, food, activity. Activity can be sitting, walking, running. Um, and then, of course, I have just the act of going places, which is a low-friction uh, check-in for locations. And then I've got environmental check-ins, which are like the temperature in the room right now, the lights, the sound. Um, and then I put all that information together into one coherent view of each moment in my day so I can go back and look at it like a super diary of everything I did and how it affected me. So often we go through life not wondering why we feel the way we are, why we're provoked, why are we anxious, and we don't look at the underlying causes of the people and or places that we're visiting. So you can actually, if I get this right, you can go back and say, I feel like shit right now because the temperature was bad, this person was there in the room and I don't like him, and I didn't eat very well the day before and I only slept four hours. And you can start drawing conclusions around the data. Yes. And not only that can I go back, but I can predict forward. <laughs> Uh, so oh, wow. data isn't really about looking back. It, it's more about managing now and anticipating tomorrow. So for this meeting with you guys, because I had to leave Sweden, uh, and I've been there seven months this year, I had to prepare to be up in the middle of the night. So it's about preconditioning your environment so that you have a better future. Um, and a lot of people don't understand that, but they do when they look at a map, because oftentimes your phone will tell you, leave now for your appointment so you're not late. That's just a really simple way of location preconditioning. But what do you say to people that uh, kind of like humans and don't want to be cyborgs and, and feel, you know, it's, it's a lot of information as it is right now? What, what do you tell guys like that? Well, oh. You know, Hannes and I debate this a lot. <laughs> I think over time um. we'll see that uh, these things become ubiquitous in our presence. So uh, it will be, we, we are seeing the Internet of Things and billions of connected devices appearing around us. And... I think that right now, when we speak the Internet of Things, we speak about connected cars and you know connected home alarms. But over time, we'll have connected kidneys, we'll have connected hearts, we'll have connected ears and eyes. So the human body will be fully connected, and we will be monitoring our vitals, and we will think of the Internet of Things with a much greater granularity than we do today. So there is, there is nothing to fear. Cyborgs are nice. Yeah, pretty nice. <laughs> Chris is a wonderful guy, so... Yeah. No, I think this is just in, insanely thought-provoking and interesting. We have uh, too little time to, to, to go in-depth, but uh, we'll, uh, you, you had some, 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 some issues that you couldn't come here this time, but I'll promise to have you back next time so we can learn even more. And it's also interesting because you can never argue with him because he knows exactly what happened sort of down on the blood level at that second. <laughs> no, this is what I said, I'm sure. So, so uh, mark, mark that in your calendar that I'm going to invite you back. Uh, thank you also very thank much. You're also going to be at uh, Epicenter, not tomorrow, but, but later on, and Hannes is there all the time. Thank you very much, Chris. Thanks, Hannes. See you.